Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Glad to see you here in the house of the Lord to receive those gifts that he has to give to us on this day. Special welcome you're visiting with us. We are glad you are here with us in worship on this day to receive what God gives to us. Also, as you notice up front, we have uh, several members of our youth group. Uh, these members of our youth group will be going to Houston later this week. They decide it's not hot enough here, that they're headed down to the south. So we give thanks to God that they are here and they will be commissioned for the National Youth Gathering to go to Houston to be with uh, 20,000 of their closest friends later in the week. So give thanks to God for that and we'll pray for their safe travels also. Uh, just a few announcements before we begin our worship. Just a reminder, I just want to say thank you to all those who helped with VBS, especially with, uh, to Greg and Carla Carlisle and to Kara Todd and Crystal DeLay and to all the volunteers who helped lead and feed those children who were brought to VBS. A, a huge thank you for all of what you have done and continue to do to help with VBS. So thank you to all those people who helped and thank you for those parents and grandparents who brought the children to VBS yesterday. It was a great time, great fun, as we learned that God is always with us no matter what. Also this morning, as it is the first Sunday of the month, is LWML Mite Box Sunday. So if you have brought your mites, remember to put them in the large purple and white boxes uh, around in the one out there in the narthex, another down here. So just remember about that. And also the bulletin blurb about what those mites are going to help support this month. It's a pretty neat one. It's uh, those mites go to help to support. Uh, the LWML is helping to purchase land in Uganda to build a Lutheran college. So once again, it's cool to read about how our Lutheran women are helping even in Africa from the district. Also, our LWML Indiana district met a few weeks ago and they've come back to now for the 2022 through 2024. They have a theme and Bible verse. It's what most of you got as you were coming in here. That's transformed together and together we serve based off of 2 Corinthians 3.18 was their verse as they head now into this next uh, bilinium. And just a couple of notes there. As you see, there's some scripture verses for you to read, a mealtime prayer. But if you flip on the back side of that, you see some of the grants, most of the grants that they're supporting here. They have a small grants and large grants. There's 15 mission and ministries that the LWML Indiana District is su pledging support to. And these 15 mission grants equal around $130,000. That's what our Indiana District LWML is helping sponsor and support with those mites and also with the money that the LWML raises. So it's a Pretty amazing to see that here, and that's why they gave you a bookmark so you can keep uh, them and your thoughts and prayers throughout this next several years before their next district convention. So just uh, look at that and uh, be aware of what they're going and to continue to pray for them and support them in all that they do, uh, the Lutheran Women's Missionary League. Our order of service this morning is as printed in our bulletin. We give thanks to God that we are here in his house to hear his word and receive what he has to give to us. We begin our worship with the ringing of the bells.
sing songs of love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. Their measuring line goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs his course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church in the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Continue to send your messengers to preserve your people in true peace, that by the preaching of your word, your church may be kept free from all harm and danger. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> the Old Testament reading for this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, is from Isaiah chapter 66. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her, that you may nurse and be satisfied from her consoling breast, that you may drink deeply with delight from her glorious abundance. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream. You shall nurse, you shall be carried upon her hip, and bounced upon her knees." As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice. Your bones shall flourish like the grass. And the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants, and he shall show his indignation against his enemies. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Epistle from Galatians chapter 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, 
you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason, the boast, will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And uh, as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 10th chapter. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said unto them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord to the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. The one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice 
that your names are written in heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess together our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Paul leans upon the uh, fence post and stares out into the vast fields in front of him. The sun is just beginning to make its appearance on the horizon, and the wheat fields that stretch for miles, they sway in the gentle breeze like waves on the ocean. And Paul looks out upon the wheat fields and he smiles at what he sees. It had been a good year. God had provided an abundant crop. Paul was a a fifth-generation farmer in western Kansas. He and his wife and children had made their living there on the farm, and there had been many uh, good years, some bad years, but they loved farming. They loved where they were. And as Paul leaned there on the wooden fence post and looked out upon all the wheat, he smiled. It was harvest time, and he loves harvest time. He loved getting into his combine and and bringing in all the crops and emptying them into his truck and driving the truck into the grain bin in in the town, waving at all of his friends, wondering how their harvest was going, trying to gauge what the market value would be from the yield. He enjoyed harvest. It was hard work, and it really took the most out of him. And at the end of harvest, he was tired and he's worn out and there was a lot of aches and pains he had never felt before, but it was good pain. It was good work. He loved harvest. So as he stood there on the fence post, sipping his coffee, he rejoiced that harvest had come. But the smile on his face quickly left when he recalled what had happened earlier that morning. One of the first things that Paul does when he gets up in the morning is he goes straight to check the weather, to see the forecast. And he saw there on the radar a large storm had developed in the Rockies and cascaded down the Rocky Mountains as was now going through the foothills, heading through eastern plains of Colorado, this large stone filled, a storm filled with uh, wind and torrential rains and probably even some hail. And the weatherman forecasted that that storm would hit Kansas sometime in the middle of the night. So Paul drank the last sip from his coffee cup, climbed up into the cab of his combine, turned the key, and began harvest. The storm was coming, and he knew that time was short. Dear friends in Christ, the storm is coming. Not a storm filled with wind and rain and hail, but a storm filled with God's judgment and wrath and condemnation for sin. That storm is fast approaching. The day is drawing near. The prophet Jeremiah, the ancient meteorologist, predicted this storm when he wrote, The Lord will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling. A mighty storm is rising from the ends of the earth. Jeremiah is proclaiming God's word to God's people in Jerusalem and Judah and Israel, the surrounding area. And these people, many of them, had already begun forsaking the Lord. They, many of them had even rejected God and and refused to listen to his word. The people, in fact, chased after the gods of the nations around them, and the people uh, spent more time on their carnal uh, pleasures and started, not, not only that, but inventing ways of committing evil deeds. So much so that Jeremiah has to say, they are not embarrassed by their actions, They have no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush. There's no shame, no blushing, no fear of God in the people that Jeremiah preaches to. So he reminds them, the storm is coming. And when the storm comes, they will not survive. Now, you and I don't have to think very hard, do we, 
to see images in our own culture and world today. People around us just living according to their own carnal pleasures. People who have long since rejected God as if he doesn't exist. Following their own desires. A people that no longer know how to blush and not embarrassed by their perverse actions and attitudes. A people that invent ways of doing evil. It seems like each and every day there's a new perversion that rises. A new way of contradicting God's good law. A new way of tearing down those barriers that he has put in place for our own good. It seems like every day someone comes up with a new way of doing horrible, immoral things. And not only doing it, but encouraging others to do it and expecting us to accept it as right. We live in a world where people no longer are embarrassed by their behavior or by their actions. And we are reminded that a storm is in fact coming. God's wrath and judgment will be poured out upon this world. In Jeremiah's day, that storm came to Jerusalem and Judah in the form of the Babylonian army under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. They, they stormed into Israel and into Judah, and they laid waste to the land, carried the people off into exile as an instrument of God's wrath and judgment. Now, you and I today wonder, when is the storm coming? How long will God continue to put up with all this evil going on in the world? As it gets worse each and every day, how long will God allow it to happen? And how long must we as his people live in this world and suffer the persecution and the animosity because of our faith? How long, O oh God, why has he not brought the storm of destruction? And the answer is simple. He has. The storm of his wrath, condemnation, and judgment has already arrived. It has already descended upon this earth. It has not laid waste to all the nations and all the world. No, in fact, it, it arrived as a storm in just one little location. An outcropping of rocks called Golgotha. And his wrath and judgment was not poured down upon all of humanity, though we all deserve it. His wrath and judgment was poured down upon Christ, Jesus, one person who, hang on, who hung on the cross for the world and for us. All of God's wrath, condemnation, and punishment and judgment that our sins deserve was placed upon one man, Jesus Christ, there on the cross with the crack of thunder as the nails were driven into his hands. As he hung there for six hours, that storm raged around him, the storm of God's judgment, and he received the wrath that you and I deserve. Our sins upon Jesus and God's wrath poured upon him because of our sins. And for six hours in that darkness, as the storm swirled around him, he paid the price for our sins. And at the end of that time, there was a loud earthquake. The earth opened up. Jesus was buried in the grave. The storm had claimed its victim. But three days later, the earth shook again. Not with God's judgment, but with God's grace and favor and mercy. Jesus risen from the grave means that our sins have been paid for in full. Jesus has taken that punishment upon himself and he's paid that price for us. His resurrection means that not even death can swallow us permanently. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, the storm of God's judgment has passed over us. And you and I know that our sins are forgiven. And in Christ we have eternal life and salvation. 
We have peace with God, not war. We have peace with God. The barrier that would separate us from God has been destroyed. And the same Jesus who has died and risen for us has promised to come again on that great day of glory. And on that day, he will come to harvest his church. On that day, he will send his angels to gather to himself the elect. Those of us and all people who believe and trust not in ourselves for salvation, but cling to Christ alone, he will gather us to himself. Those of us who believe and know that he is God and his word is true and we live our lives according to his word, bearing the fruits of faith, he will gather us unto himself in the harvest fields. And for us, that's going to be a great day, a great day of joy and celebration as we stand together with Christ. But it will not be a day of joy and celebration for all people. For when the Lord comes again in glory, He will come like a storm. He will carry His holy sickle, and He will cut down all those who reject Him, all those who refuse to believe in Him, those who refuse to live according to his word, those, those who persecute his church, those who hate him, those who live their lives for self and pleasure, he will cut them down. And they will lie at the harvest field as empty tusks, cut down by the storm. It will not be a good day. Jeremiah, when he's proclaiming this message to uh, his people, that the storm is coming and they will not survive, Jeremiah did not proclaim that message with vengeance in his heart or hatred or malice to those who rejected God. In fact, Jeremiah was often called the weeping prophet. He wept and he lamented. He knew the storm was coming and he wasn't excited to see the storm. He wept and he lamented for the people who would be lost in the devastation. And so should our attitude be. It's easy for us, as we look at the world and everything going around, to maybe have some sense of uh, wanting the Lord to come back to do evil to all these people who reject Him. There's a part of us that would want some vindication and some justice. But our attitude is the same as Jeremiah. We weep and we mourn and we lament. For when the storm comes, people will be laid to waste. Not just people out there. Maybe people in our own homes, in our own families, our friends, people we go to school with, people in our neighborhoods, the community, state, and the world. When the storm comes, They will not survive. And so we have compassion. Why? Because God has shown His compassion to us. It's only by His grace that we believe and trust in Christ for salvation. And the same God who has shown us His grace, love, and mercy desires to show that same grace to all people of the world. He does not delight in the death of of wicked doers. He would have all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus says, the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. That's why God is patient with us, patient with his people, patient with his church. We have so much work to do. He sends us out into this world with that gospel message, that good news message. He sends us out of the world to call people to repentance, to recognize their need for a Savior, and to proclaim that Savior in Jesus Christ. He calls us to go out into the world, wherever that is, and share that good news so that when that message is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit can work and the harvest grows even larger. This week, as you know, we are uh, sending some young people 
off to uh, Houston for the National Youth Gathering. And I, not just young people, but old people who are crazy that go with them. Uh, but uh, I often get asked this, because this happens every three years, we send our youth group uh, members off to a youth gathering. Why do we send our kids to a youth gathering? All the expense and all the travel and, and all that. There's a lot of answers to that, but I would simply say, because it's important for you, young people, youth, teens, it's important for you to have a time to get away. The reality is our teenagers and our young people are usually on the front lines of a lot of this stuff happening in our world and our culture. In fact, many times are the targets of these things. And so for just a time, we get to withdraw by ourselves to gather with 20,000 other youth going through the exact same things, dealing with the same temptations, the same struggles and challenges of our world, to be able to get together, to hear God's word, to worship and to be strengthened in our faith and to share those stories together and to grow in our faith together and to grow with our relationships with one another. Because when you come back, you're back out into the world with us. And you walk with us hand in hand, arm in arm, out in the harvest field and proclaim God's love. And you do things that we don't get to do, nor do we want to anymore. None of us want to go back to high school. I don't think, and relive that, but there you are, and you are called to serve the Lord in that place. Together, young and old, together we are called by Christ to go out into the world and to share his good news, to share his love, because the storm is coming. As Paul uh, circles his fields in his combine, he makes pass after pass, round of round, and trip after trip, and he just brings in the crop. Even, even when the sun goes down, he's harvesting. And when he sees the lightning in the distance, he's harvesting. When he hears the rolling thunder, he's harvesting. When the winds begin to blow against the cab of his combine, he's still out there harvesting. And when the large drops of rain begin to fall, he does not stop. He keeps driving that combine around and around. He's still harvesting. The storm is coming. Time is short. There's so much work to be done. May you and I have that same sense of urgency as we go out into the harvest fields and share Christ with the world because the storm is coming. Amen. May the peace of God which transcends all our human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen. Having heard the word, and as our offerings are brought forward at this time, we continue with our offertory hymn on the bottom of page 8 and the top of page 9 in our bulletins, God Bless Our Native Land.
This time we have our National Youth Gathering Participant Commissioning Service, so I'll ask or the youth and the adult leaders to please stand at this time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, you are about to begin a journey where you will gather with 25,000 other people who confess that Jesus, who is true God and true man, is over all things whether visible or invisible, temporal or eternal, physical or spiritual. He is in all things, and by his blood you have been reconciled to God. You will spend five days in worship and the study of his word, serving others and celebrating our faith in Jesus Christ. We give thanks that you will have this opportunity to grow in your faith and love together while you are in Houston. Youth. You have spent months preparing for this event. While you are gone, you will have an opportunity at God's chosen people to put your faith into action as you clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love, peace, and thankfulness. It is our prayer that whatever you do, whether in word or deed, you do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. To that end, do you promise to love and care for each other as a family? Will you encourage one another to do everything to God's glory? Will you dedicate yourselves to making this a good experience for everyone, showing patience and love in word and action? Will you represent our congregation in a God-pleasing fashion? If so, then say yes with the help of God. As adult leaders of our young people, you are a special blessing to us all. You have cared for our youth. You have nurtured their faith. As you have prayed for them, you have encouraged them. We thank you for your commitment unto them. Now, as you prepare to leave, we commend these young people into your care. Will you consider, con continue to love and guide them before, during, and after the gathering? If so, then say, yes, with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. Parents, family members, and friends, you have supported this group. You have helped them prepare for the National Youth Gathering. Will you now pray for them while they are gone, asking God to keep them safe and to fill them with the Holy Spirit? enabling them to live as Christ's holy people, standing firm in the faith. If so, then saying, yes, we will keep these loved ones in our thoughts and prayers. Yes, we will keep these loved ones in our thoughts and prayers. Let us pray. Lord, you have called us to be your people by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, you have given us our confession of faith. We give thanks for your love and mercy, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the community and identity that we share together in Christ. We commend our loved ones into your care as they travel. Watch over and protect them. When they arrive in Houston, open them to the joy and the excitement awaiting for them. Build their faith. Strengthen them in understanding your love for them. Direct them to see and to experience your love in all that they do. Make them reflections of your light. Help them to share your light with everyone they meet. And when it is time to return, bring each one safely home to us, enriched by their experiences at the National Youth Gathering. In your most gracious name we pray. Amen. Go with God's blessings. Grow in the name of our Lord. Gather with God's beloved people and love as you have been loved in Christ. May God bless you and keep you now and forever in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be unto God. At this time, the rest of the congregation, please stand for prayer.
O Lord of the harvest, at your son's instruction, we pray that you would continue to send laborers into the harvest fields, that the plentiful harvest may be gathered into the peace of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, O oh God, you sent Jesus to preach your word, and he likewise sent forth the apostles and the 72. Grant peace to those who are persecuted throughout the world because they proclaim and confess your word with thanksgiving, even when wolves threaten to devour them. Lord, in your mercy, merciful Lord, your son sent the 72 with the charge to enter homes to proclaim peace and declare the coming of your kingdom. Grant our homes to be places in which your peace dwells, that husbands and wives love and honor one another, that children are nurtured in fear and faith toward your holy name, and that your kingdom comes among us. We thank you also for those couples who are celebrating wedding anniversaries this week, for Paul and Lisa Austin, Merrill and Erica Punky, Robert and Mary Stevens, JP and Katie Claiborne, Daniel and Shannon Wright, Jason and Lisa McEwen, and Steve and Marilyn Merling. Lord, in your mercy, O oh Lord, on this weekend when we remember our nation's beginning and observe Independence Day, give peace to all nations, that our people may enjoy the comforting goodness of your will being done on earth. Protect those who defend our liberty and freedom as they serve in the armed forces, including Brady Kell, Corinne Ravello, Ryan Skeels, Brittany Ball, Sam Brockman, Michael McDonald, Isaac Tedder, Scott Lewick, Molly Sawyer, Matthew Martin, Hunter Perdue, and Jason Lynn. Hear our prayers on behalf of all who make, administer, and judge our laws, and provide opportunities for your gospel to be proclaimed without hindrance. Lord, in your mercy, God of all compassion, in your Son you have borne the burdens of all mankind. Look with mercy upon Bob Grant, Frank Reichowich, John Woodson, Carol Stevens, Bob Hartman, Louis Benton, Joel Sutton, Byron Sint Sr., Ethan Fenwick, Raymond Kinzel, Don Diekman, Phyllis Diekman, Becca Anderson, Betty Southwood, Kayla Spicer, Dennis Morgan, Doretta Fairchild, Jennifer Fioka, Bob Hoffman, Jim Strudevant, Mark Kell, Ruth Bashir, Gary Burke, and all for whom we pray. According to your gracious will, restore these servants with strength and healing now and grant them patience to await the resurrection on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. Generous Father, keep our hearts from greed, that we may joyfully support your church and those who serve us in your name. Keep us, the people of St. Paul's, especially Kathy Leffler, Jerry Leffler, Quentin Leffler, Justin, Max, and Sam Logan, Terry Logston, and those not in attendance with us this day, from the pride of heart, that delights more in what we do than what you have done for us. Accept with our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving the tithes and offerings we bring forward before you this day. Lord, in your mercy, God of Israel, as your people of old drank and were satisfied by your abundant comfort shown to Jerusalem, may those in our community likewise be comforted with your temporal and eternal care. Watch over all the food pantry recipients in our community as you tend to them in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy, how awesome are your deeds, O Lord. You have planted us and directed us to pray that you would send workers into your harvest, harvest fields. You have answered that prayer through your Son and his church. As your kingdom draws nearer each day, teach us to boast only in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, rejoicing that our names are written in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.